everyone. Uh, welcome to the Majors and Quinn Facebook page and YouTube channel. My name is Annie. I'm the events coordinator at Majors and Quinn Booksellers in Minneapolis, Minnesota. If you're not familiar with us, we are an independent bookstore. And if this is your first virtual author event with us, welcome. If this is not your first, welcome back. Thanks for watching. Uh, very pleased to have another virtual author conversation for you this evening, this time about uh, the great sport of hockey. We're very pleased to have the author of The Fastest Game in the World talking about his new book here tonight. That's Bruce Berglund. And he's going to be in conversation with Rich Cohen, who also has a recent title out about hockey called Pee Wee's Confessions of a Hockey Parent. Um, so they're going to have a conversation, do a little bit of reading from the book, and you can ask questions for the end of the program. You can ask them at any time, however, if you're watching on Facebook, put them in the comments. If you're watching on YouTube, put them in the chat on the side of the screen. We'll see them and we'll get to them at the end. Also, feel free to just tune, uh, chime in and let us know where you're tuning in from. Uh, we would just love to see where you're watching from and say hello. I'll also be putting in the chat direct links to uh, Bruce's book and Rich's book. So in case you want to head to our website, which is majorsandquinn.com, you can go straight there and see more about these books and maybe buy them if you do so. We really appreciate it. It helps us continue to offer free events like this one. So thank you very much. Um, please allow me to give you a brief introduction of our speakers. Bruce Berglund uh, was raised on the outdoor rinks of Duluth, where he played, coached, and refereed youth hockey. After earning degrees, he spent two decades as a faculty member at KU and Calvin College, earning awards for his teaching and writing on 20th century Eastern Europe. He returned to hockey to research its history as a world sport, traveling to Canada, Europe, and East Asia as a Fulbright Global Scholar. Now again based in Minnesota, he works at Gustavus Adolphus College and teaches writing classes at the Loft Literary Center in Minneapolis, and has been featured in documentaries for Twin Cities Public Television and the NPR program Only a Game. Each week, he reports on American politics, culture, and sports for the Western Australian station ABC Radio Perth. Thank you very much for being here, Bruce. And we're so pleased to welcome back um, Rich Cohen, who uh, had an event with us a few weeks ago, so you can find that on our YouTube channel as well. Rich Cohen's the New York Times bestselling author of The Chicago Cubs, Story of a Curse, and Monsters, The 1985 Chicago Bears, and The Wild Heart of Football. Uh, and his most recent book, as I said, is Pee Wee's Confessions of a Hockey Parent. Bruce and Rich, thank you so much for being here, and uh, I will be back at the end to help go through questions. Thank you, Annie. All right, I'm going to uh, start out with reading, uh, and then Rich and I are going to get into uh, questions. Um, so something I wanted to do in the book, as, as Annie was saying, I went to a number of different countries. I went to seven different countries to do research for the book, and I wanted to look at uh, the history of hockey as a global sport, and in particular, uh, to look at how the sport spread across the Atlantic, uh, from Canada into the United States and then into Europe. And I discuss that in my opening, opening chapter. And one of the things that I look at in the first chapter of the book is how there are a variety of different kinds of hockey in the 19th century. Uh, there was uh, a version of hockey and it was called hockey that was played in Europe. It originated in England, it was played on a, on a frozen field about as big as a soccer field with uh, usually 11 players on a side. And uh, this sport is commonly called bandy today. It's still played in, um, in Scandinavia, in Russia, as well as in, in the United States and Canada. Uh, the Canadian game, the game with a puck that was played indoors on a smaller rink, uh, when this spreads to Europe, uh, Europeans are already playing the English version of hockey. And so the passage I want to read to start out is kind of looking at the early history of the sport and how you have these different kinds of hockey and people begin to adopt this winter sport. So the first time Josef Laufer saw Canadians play hockey in Prague in 1911, he was amazed. The illustrations in his memoir depict the Canadians with chests like bears and forearms like tree trunks. These were giants from the North Woods, towering over the Europeans. And they played like masters, like magicians. They flew like a whirlwind, he recalled, and the puck raced between them like zigzags of lightning. As secretary of the Czech Hockey Association, 
Laufer had organized the visit. He was eager to see Canadian hockey played by its inventors, as it was meant to be played. But he was also nervous. These Canadians had defeated teams across Europe by dozens of goals. After the visitors trounced the club Slavia 15 to nothing in their first game in Prague, Laufer feared the worst for the national team, who took the ice against the Canadians the following day. They wouldn't get to 20, or maybe they could, he wrote in his memoir. The founder of the Czech Association sat next to Laufer, nervously twisting the ends of his handlebar mustache. As the Canadians scored their first goal and then their second, Laufer did the math and watched the clock. How badly would it turn out? But then, midway through the first half, Czech defensemen started to keep pace, hounding the Canadians down the ice. The Czech goalie turned away blistering shots. At the break, the house were down only four to nothing. Laufer was relieved. The Czechs could hold them to single digits. The second half, however, was stunning. The Canadians became increasingly frustrated as they tried to add to their tally. The Czech players were out of breath, chasing the Canadians across the rink, keeping them away from the goal. Laufer kept his eyes on the watch, counting down the 30-minute half, not believing what was happening. At the end, the Czechs held the score to four to nothing. Cheers from the home crowd swept over the rink. Laufer screamed himself hoarse. Lord in heaven, he wrote decades later, the second half without any goals and a final score of four to nothing. The world had never seen anything like it. It was a victory for all of Europe. Not many Canadians were playing hockey in Europe at the turn of the century. The team that visited Prague in 1911 was made up of students from Oxford University. The Oxford Canadians, as they were called, traveled the continent during winter break in the years before the First World War, playing clubs and national teams. The scores were typically lopsided. Even though Europeans were no strangers to skating or hockey, the Canadian version of the game was uh, the Canadian version of the game was unfamiliar. The Oxford Canadians, however, did not act as imperialists in bringing their version of hockey to Europe. To be sure, they ran up high scores against opponents. In one game, they crushed Belgium 26 to zero. But a number of games were competitive. The Paris and London skating clubs were able to play even with the Canadians, earning the occasional win or draw. Those were games played with a puck. In places where hockey with a ball was still the norm, um, the Canadians played along. Photographs show the Oxford Canadians playing various styles of hockey at a 1910 tournament in saint Moritz, Switzerland. In one photo, they are playing the puck. In another, they are shown after a game holding short bandy sticks. When playing, Canadian, or when playing European hockey on a large rink with large goals and a ball, the Canadians were evenly matched with their opponents. Still, spectators recognized that the visitors' speed and skill was beyond those of any European team. For example, the Oxford students visited Vienna in 1912 for two games. In the first game, played with a ball, the hosts beat the Canadians 7-4. A Vienna sports writer observed that the Canadians were not used to playing with the ball and had difficulty adjusting to the larger rink. The students showed their true abilities in the second game, where they, quote, played the Vienna team into the ground. After the previous day's loss, the Canadians took the rematch 14 to four. The Oxford University Ice Hockey Club sparked interest in the Canadian version of the game in Europe. After their tours in the winters of 1910, 1911, and 1912, the term Canadian hockey appeared in the German and Austrian press to denote a game distinct from bandy. Yet despite the talent of the Canadians, despite the allure of their Oxford status and their North American origins, their game did not fully displace Europe's version of hockey. Canadian hockey was promoted by national federations in Europe, 
But clubs in Vienna, Prague, Budapest, and Berlin still played with short sticks and a ball in the winter of 1914. And they still called the game hockey. Am I back? You're back. Hi. I played <laughs> hockey in Oxford, Oxford team. I don't know if Did you? Was, uh, I, yeah, I was in England for a year. And another guy who uh, was from Ohio and played at Wesleyan, I think. We, we went to, we saw open, we saw a tryout. We were studying there and we thought we were going to like, you know, dominate. And it was all almost entirely like road scholars who were division one hockey players and Canadians. And it was the hardest hockey I've ever played in my life, but got that really cool Jersey that's at Oxford on it and everything. So. Did fun. you go to Switzerland? They still, they still play the game against Cambridge in Switzerland, right? I, or no? I remember all I remember was Cambridge. I don't really even remember. It's like a blur. I was in college. I can't really remember. <laughs> Mostly I remember that we had to wake up like at four in the morning to practice. That's the main and feeling like I was going to throw up because they skated so hard. Yeah, All right. So yeah, I have some yeah. questions. I wrote a bunch of questions, but just listening to you read, I have some questions that just come to mind. Okay. Because I don't know if there's any way to know this, but so much of hockey is the kind of roughness of the game, you know? Mm -hmm. And I just, where does, has it always been a rough game like that? Is it just a nature of the fact that you're moving very quickly and there's collisions or why is that so built into the game? Yeah, that's a good question. I talk about that in the first part of the book, uh, you know, and it's so, I mean, it's still a subject of debate in hockey, right? Is, is the roughness of the sport and the violence of the sport. Uh, so the larger game, the game on the larger ice bandy was not as rough due to the fact that there were just, you know, there was so much more expanse for people to avoid each other. And in fact, a lot of early bandy games uh, would have mixed teams of men and women playing against each other. And the, and the idea was that it was, because it wasn't a rough sport, uh, it was one that was suitable for, uh, suitable for women. Um, the Canadian game of hockey uh, was rough right from the start. And, uh, and there were criticisms by, so, so Canadian hockey begins as really kind of a, uh, an Anglo-Protestant elite game in, in Montreal and Ottawa and Kingston, Ontario, and then later in Toronto. And so you have these young men from kind of the elite classes of English speaking Protestant Canadian society, and they're really British in mindset. And, and, and if you think of 19th century British sports, in particular, the sports of, of boarding schools in Britain, you think of rugby and soccer, those were, those were rough sports because they were intended to uh, strengthen the young men of England to go out and build the empire. And you have the same mentality in Canadian boarding schools and in the upper class of, of English Canadian society. And so when these young men start playing hockey, they want it to be a rough, a rough sport. And uh, uh, hockey, Canadian hockey is really derived from, derived from rugby. Its early rules were taken from rugby. And in fact, um, the early organizers of puck hockey, they thought of it as training during the winter for, for rugby. And so, so violence was intrinsic to it. And because of that, once the Canadians start going out into Europe and into the United States, bringing their game with them, uh, the repre repre uh, excuse me, the reputation preceded them that, that they were rough. And, uh, and this carried through, you know, from the 19th century into the 20th century, that the Canadian version of the game was a rough game and that the Canadians were thugs. When the, uh, Canadians went and played the Russians. Were they, did they change, did they play the same way? Like, you know, obviously the Russians didn't have fighting as part of their game. Did the Canadians expect the Russians to fight with them? I mean, did they, was that a shock to the Russians the way the Canadians played? Yeah, no. And when the, when the Canadians would go into Europe, uh, so, so each year beginning in 1930, there's been the, the, uh, the International Ice Hockey Federation World Championships are held every year. Uh, it's typically held in Europe. And from the 1930s up until the early 1960s, the team that Canada sent to Europe for the World Championships was the senior amateur team, so the community team that had won the national championship the year before. So instead of having a team of players drawn from all over Canada, you'd have a club from one community, they would go overseas and they played a series of exhibition games and then in the world championship. 
And in, in the 30s, these teams would draw attention all over Europe for their just remarkable play. You know, it was the Europeans said the Canadians are the best in the world at hockey. By the late 1940s into the 50s, these Canadian teams had a reputation basically as, as being uh, for fighting, uh, for slashing, for hitting. And the Europeans were starting to sour on it. Uh, you know, it was usually the case that the Canadians would be booed on the ice. There was an instance in Finland where the Finnish fans were throwing snowballs at the Canadian team. Uh, so, the, so the Europeans didn't like this brand of hockey that the Canadians were playing. The Canadians, meanwhile, because they were the inventors of hockey, they said, well, this is this is the way you play hockey. Hockey's meant to be a rough sport. It's meant to be hard hitting. It's meant to have fights and so forth. And so they saw Europeans, in particular the, the Swedes and the Finns, as playing kind of a, a lesser version of the game because they because they wouldn't fight. Uh, and that was the case with the Russians as well. You know, the Russians, the Russians could hit, right? Yeah. The Russians could check and the Russians could take a check. Uh, but the Russians wouldn't be typically wouldn't be baited into baited into fighting. And this was something that, uh, you know, this was a cause of tension between uh, between the the Canadians and the Europeans. When when the Canadians, when Team Canada, a team of NHL players, plays against the Soviet national team in 1972 in the Summit Series, the Soviet players said they were big, they were tough, and they hit hard. And it and it shocked them just how just how strong and hard hitting these Canadian pros were. Yeah. Um, now was fight, but was the actual fighting, was that always part? I mean, I always got the sense it came to the NHL later, you know, I mean, was that, was it dropping the gloves and circling each other, that whole thing? Was that always part of the professional hockey or? Yeah, back, back in the 19th century already, there were reports of, of fights, you know, not like what we see today. You know, there was just a fight the other, the other night, no, even right at the first face off, uh, you know, at the start of the game where two guys, they just drop the gloves right away. So this idea that both teams have enforcers who are just, it, it's inevitable that they're going to fight. You didn't have that kind of, of showdown style fighting uh, early on. What you d you did have fights and you did have brawls early on. And you had a lot of slashing and cross-checking and so forth. And this is in the reports right away in the 19th century. And the, and the Kind of these these elite Anglo Protestant uh, leaders of early organized hockey in Canada, you know, on the one hand, they wanted this rough sport to toughen up the boys and the young men of Canada to help build the empire, and at the other hand, they didn't they didn't like the the crudeness of of fighting and the violence in hockey, and so they would call for it. No, we need to have a clean brand of hockey, but it still has to be hard hitting. And you could see they were they were in something of a bind, right? You know, one person's uh, you know one person's hard hitting hockey is another person's violent hockey, and uh, and so hockey's always had this difficult um, balancing act, right? That that um, the the hard hitting the rough aspect of the sport is always there. It's intrinsic to it, something that's valued, uh, and yet there's the recognition that that can lead pretty quickly to uh, to more negative violence, right? That's interesting. So what's the early evidence, earliest evidence? I know you mentioned was going on. Is there any earlier evidence of people playing anything like hockey? What's the first evidence of it? Because I'd always go to the museum and see those paintings from like the 15, 1600s. Of people. Yeah. Yep, exactly. Okay. Yeah. So Dutch, Dutch landscape paintings, yeah. right? Where there's a guy with a, you know, with a, with a, with a hook stick who's on, you know, he's got a ball on a frozen canal. And yeah, these are, these are the early versions of hockey that they date back to, uh, you know, date back to the 16th, 16th, 17th century, uh, back to the Netherlands where, where skating begins. And one thing I talk about in the first chapter of the book is how hockey emerges out of this, uh, this period called the little ice age, right? From yeah. about the 1400s into the mid 1800s when the climate throughout the Northern hemisphere was much colder than it is now. Uh, when you'd have, you know, for instance, the entire Venice lagoon would freeze solid uh, during the little ice age, or you'd have, uh, you know, you think of uh, in a Christmas Carol by Charles Dickens that you have London covered in snow. There's never snow in London at Christmas now, but there was when Dickens was a child. And so, so the Northern Hemisphere was much colder, and this is when all of our winter activities 
uh, really have their origins. Uh, when skating becomes an entertainment, starting in the Netherlands and then moving to England, uh, skiing as a form of transportation and then becoming a sport, uh, curling beginning in Scotland, uh, and of course, and you have versions of hockey. Uh, in the book, I talk about one of the earliest hockey clubs, organized hockey clubs, and it was called hockey. Uh, it was in England, was in Northeast England, and it begins in the early 1800s, really in the heart of the Little Ice Age. And they would play this version that we now call bandy, where you have a number of players on each side. You know, it's basically soccer on ice, right. played with a rubber ball on skates and with a hooked stick. Yeah, it's interesting. Did they have goalies? Yeah, they did. Yep. Yeah, you had goalies. You had much bigger goals, though, than, uh, uh, you know, than a goal in hockey, in, in puck hockey. But, yeah, they had they had goalies. And, yeah, and they had all of the, you know, all of the skills that we appreciate in hockey. Uh, there were people who wrote about this English version of hockey or bandy, as it was called. And they would write about, you know, passing. They would write about, uh, you know, strong shots and strong defense and good goaltending. Uh, one of the things, one of the quotes I remember from like a 19th century account of a bandy game is, well, there's this one guy, he's a fantastic skater. He's a fantastic stick handler, but he's a hongo. He doesn't use the word hongo, but it's right. the same principle. Uh, the guy who, the guy who never passes the puck. Yeah. That's, <laughs> so that's just human nature. That's probably the same going back to that. <laughs> Earliest version. What did they call a hongo for uh, for Oxford? I can't imagine Oxford students using the phrase hongo. I don't. I don't. I just puck hog. That's just what we would call them. <laughs> um. So, uh, why did the game become? If it was played in all these places, why did it become the Canadian game? Yeah. So that's um. Well, the Canadian game, which is the game that's played around the world today, uh, you do have originating in Canada, the game played with a puck, played on an indoor rink in a more confined space. Uh, so this is the game that begins in Montreal in 1875. Uh, and and from Montreal, it spreads throughout Eastern Canada, it begins to move into Western Canada already, already by the 1880s. Uh, and then goes from there into the United States and over to Europe. Prior to the arrival of this Canadian version of the game, as I was uh, wanted to get at in my reading, uh, Europeans were already playing this, this version of hockey, and they called it hockey, played with a ball on a broader expanse. In the United States, up in New England and in the Midwest, there was a game called ice polo that was played on a small indoor rink, you know, so basically an indoor roller skating rink where they'd freeze the floor in the winter, they put on ice skates, but they would also play with a ball and a crook stick like the game in Europe. So when the Canadian version of the game played with a smaller number of players and with the puck, uh, when that version reaches the United States and reaches Europe, slowly, uh, the Europeans and the Americans adopt this Canadian version. So that's that's where we get this notion of, of hockey as a Canadian game. People in the United States and in Europe had been playing playing versions of hockey before Canadian hockey arrives, but it's the version with the puck that ultimately takes over. And at some point they put the boards up, right? I mean, that's got to be a big thing. Yeah, but that doesn't come right away. You know, the the... The first games of hockey, the first indoor games of hockey in Canada were played at, you know, kind of recreational or, or kind of upper class skating rinks, you know, where they'd have these, you know, many people have seen these, these um, prints from the 19th century of, you know, people all dressed up going to these skating parties. There would be an orchestra. Sometimes there would be costumes at these skating events. And so this is where hockey originates. And because it's it's a skating rink, they don't have boards up, right? Yeah. And in fact, the reason why in the first game they used a puck was to keep the, the projectile in on the rink. Okay. They didn't want if they, they knew if they used a ball, the ball would fly up into yeah. Uh, into the fans. So they didn't have boards around the rink. This is something that comes later in, in Canada by the turn of the century. But even, even in the 1930s in European rinks, you don't have boards or else you just have boards at the ends behind the goals. On the sides of the rink, you might just have a small divide. So there's plenty of pictures. And this was something that surprised me in the course of my research. You know, I'd look through all these pictures of, of games in Europe and you'd have fans standing right at the edge of the rink. And so the, the effect of that is that in European hockey, 
you know, the game was much more played down the middle. It was much more of a much more of a passing game as opposed to in North American hockey where you could use the use the full boards. Yeah. It's interesting. All these things like have unintended consequences yeah. that completely change the game. So even when I was a little kid, the first rink I played on, we didn't have plexiglass. We had a uh, chain link fence. So, you know, you couldn't um, pass the puck off the fence. It made the game smaller somehow, you know? So Yeah, 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 yeah. And the effect in, uh, you know, so I talk about this in the book and it was, you know, it was really fascinating as I dug into this and dug into the history of hockey strategy. Uh, the European rinks were more uh, more rectangular. They had squared corners. Uh, in many cases, no boards. Which seems, really uh, bad, by the way, a squared corner seems bad. Seems, seems bad. what? Dangerous. Yeah, yeah, but they didn't go into the corners, right? You have to go in and get it. Yeah, but that's but that's us, you know, having played North American hockey, that where we think, you know, a fundamental part of the game is going into the corners. But you have squared corners, you don't have boards in the corners, and so and also European hockey is influenced much more by by soccer. And if you think of soccer, you you know, when you're on offense, you don't want to go into the corners, right? Uh, Whereas whereas in North American hockey you know, playing out of the corners is a fundamental skill when you're on offense. And a big part of that comes from in North American ranks, one, you have boards the whole way around, uh, but you also have curved corners. And this is something that comes from in the 1890s, one of the first arenas, the first arena built specifically for hockey in Montreal uh, was designed with this more oval shaped rink with the rounded corners. Prior to that point, Canadian rinks also had were more like rectangles with squared corners. Yeah. And you can think of how that changes the game, right? You know, with rounded corners, then you can start you can start dumping the puck into the corners and playing in the corners. Uh, and so, yeah, and so the, cor- the game would stop more. There'd be less flow to it because it was yes, like, yeah, stop. exactly. It's interesting. It sounds like what about things like the slap shot? Like, do you know how that started and, and how that changed hockey? Yeah, so that's something I don't discuss it as much in the book, but that's something that uh, dates really from the nineteen the nineteen fifties, um, and that's part of one of the things I do discuss in the book is is the difference between European hockey and North American hockey, and this is already evident in the in the nineteen twenties, is the difference between a more passing game, which is what you see in Europe. Uh, a more possession oriented game and a game more about power, which is what you see in North America. Not just not only power in terms of hitting, but power in terms of in terms of offense. And this is something, you know, I write about it with strategy, but much more interesting to me is the cultural history and how reporters in the sports pages in Europe and in North America would write about hockey and what they would emphasize. So sports writers in Europe, whether Czech or Austrian or Swiss, they would talk about speed and passing. Whereas sports writers in Canada and the United States would talk about power. They would talk about hard hits and hard shots and and shots that were pummeling the goalie. Uh, They would talk about hard forechecking as a key part of offense. And so the the slap shot kind of comes out of that. And this is something when the slap shot develops in in Canada, this is something that amazes the Europeans, right? This, This idea of the powerful shot. Right. It's interesting because, I mean, I, 1972, I was just a little kid. My brother was really into that when the Summit Series happened. But it's like we grew up in the Cold War and the idea that everything in, in the West and America was superior, everything, you know, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Beans, the sodas, the movies. And then you see that and you have to admit when you watch the Russians hockey, it's better. I mean, that's how I thought. It's not just that they were a good match for the Canadians, but their hockey was more interesting. The American hockey yep. got kind of boring and even to play where you just dump it in and then you go fight for possession and you try to seal off the, at the blue line and yep. it's boring, you know, yep. so did the, yep. did the Canadian play did the, and by the way, if they, if there hadn't been the cold war, maybe that wouldn't have developed differently because they would have been more exchanged between the different teams. Like they were kind of had their own system yeah. You didn't really have Russians playing in the NHL until whatever. No, no, no. And that's an interesting question, right? If you didn't have the, yeah. uh, if you didn't have the cold war, I do kind of speculate, you know, cause there was a lot of already in the thirties, there was really some, there was a cool mixture in the 1930s in Europe where Canadians were going often over and playing. So these Canadian teams would go over and play, but you also had a number about, 
uh, about six or seven dozen Canadians who were playing in Europe for European clubs. Uh, so there's really this fascinating mixture of different ideas and, and it's really the Great Depression and then the war brings an end to this um, kind of this takeoff point for European hockey and then it gets and then it gets pushed back and then of course after the war is when the Soviets the Soviets take over but no you're exactly right you know Anatoly Tarasov the the coach of the Soviet team he said about the Canadians you know you guys you guys are boring in what you do you know you've you've run out of ideas you do the same thing you know whereas we're much more progressive we're much more open to new ideas we look for different sources of ideas and so forth. And uh, after the Summit series, there was a fascinating, one of, one of the favorite pieces of material I've found in my research. You know, when you do research in archives, you find these things and you're just like, wow, this is, this is terrific. I got to get this into my book. And in 1973, in the summer, Ken Dryden went to Europe and the Soviet Union. It was kind of like this fact-finding mission. Uh, Canadian hockey authorities sent him over and he interviewed a number of Soviet and Czech and Swedish coaches about, about their game. And, and he came away with this realization of, wow, we are, you know, we as in Canadians, we are stuck in our development. And, and the Russians, the Czechs, the Swedes, they are much more open to new ideas. Uh, they're much more progressive in bringing in, you know, current trends and exercise science and so forth. And so he saw during that trip, he, you know, one, he understood uh, why the Canadians had such difficulty against the Soviets in the summit series, but he also became aware of this is the direction that hockey needs to go. Right. It's no, so that's interesting because that, that I grew up playing hockey in the seventies and the eighties. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and me too. Come, yeah. Yeah. When I come back for my son after 20 years away from hockey, youth hockey, it's completely different how they mm -hmm. train them and, yep. and the way they learn skating. It's like, I watch my son, practicing i'm like he looks like a figure skater man like yeah. he would have gone and knocked him down just out of sheer general principles like look at how he's looks like he's about to launch into a triple axle the way they have him spinning is that because of the russians i mean is that when, why the skating changed why did it the whole way they, they they the skating is so much better and um it's so much prettier yeah and i'm just yeah. wondering if it, if it was a russian influence if it was you know yeah, so this begins, you're exactly right. So this begins uh, after the Summit Series in 1972. So the Summit Series, for those who don't know, this was an eight-game series between the Soviet national team and a team of NHL players representing Canada. So it was an eight-game series. Uh, the Canadians ended up, let's see, there was one tie, the Soviets won three, and the Canadians ended up winning four, and they won the last game on this last second, last second goal, which for Canadians is, you know, the greatest goal in the history of Canadian hockey right. in 1972. Uh, so the event, though, even though the Canadians won the series, uh, the fact that the Soviets were so good uh, and in many games dominated the Canadians, this really caused the leaders of Canadian hockey, as well as just Canadian parents to start to question, wait a minute, you know, how is it that we're teaching our kids this, this sport? And uh, in the book I talk about, there were so many studies done by provincial governments, by the national government, uh, looking into this question of how is it that we're training our kids in hockey? And, and, one of, and this is when you begin to have um, coaching clinics and seminars, and they're bringing over European coaches and Russian coaches. And so you have these ideas start to develop at that time in the 1970s that, hey, we need to, we need to teach our kids how to skate. Right. We need to have just skating practice instead of instead of scrimmaging. Right. So you probably remember when you were playing in the 70s, like I was when we went to practice, you know, we do, you know, you do a couple drills. Right. You skate up and down the rink and then you just scrimmage. Right? Yeah, you play three on two or whatever it was. Yeah. You know, and this and this is really the Canadian way of learning the game is that you you learn hockey by playing hockey, by you yeah. scrimmage and you learn hockey sense. Whereas the European way and the Soviet way was no, you need to you need to master the fundamental skills in practice. And so Canadians began to push for this. They began, you know, some Canadians, I should say, began to push for this. But, you know, the people who still ultimately had power in Canadian hockey were those at the top level in the NHL. And they're like, no, we're not doing this. And, you know, and think of it at that time, that's when fighting in hockey was at really its apex, right? right. During the 1970s. So you have these two competing tensions, cultural tensions, right? 
traditional Canadian hockey, rough hockey, and these new ideas coming from the Soviet Union and from Europe that, no, we need to have a more skills-oriented game. And something that I talk about in the book is when, you know, what really brings about a change? Well, one is, is Gretzky and the Oilers. You know, this is when people in the NHL realize that, you know, a fast-moving, possession-oriented European style of play that can win Stanley Cups, and that's something that we want to adopt. Yeah. But then the other thing that happens, and it's also Canadian, connected with Gretzky, is that as salaries start going up and more skilled players start coming from Europe and then from Eastern Europe and the Soviet Union after 1989, pl professional hockey players realize the competition is so tight that we need, we need to get in shape, we need to improve our skills, we need to work at being top level players who can compete with their Europeans. And so this really takes place uh, in the 1990s is when you get the greater emphasis on uh, you know, learning skills as a key part of the game. When hockey becomes much more, being a hockey player is much more about mastery of skills as opposed to you know, back in our day was going up and down the ice and yeah. you know and playing it was like, it was like slot hockey or yeah you're exactly right it yeah. was like slot hockey as opposed to and that and that shift right that's that's really alien to to guys of our generation that really takes place in the 1990s after after you and i are out of the sport but i will say and i don't know if you i'm just curious like watching my son's team and everything it sometimes seems like so much attention is spent on judging the kids skills that you do miss some of that hockey. I mean, you miss yep. the kids that love to play hockey, you know, and encouraging yep. them because yep. you could be the greatest skater in the world, but if you don't want to be there, it doesn't matter. You're going to find a way not to be there. You yeah. know? So if it's sort of an overcorrection, you know, in some sense like the, yeah, no, I did about 40 interviews for the book, and that was that was a common refrain I heard. I heard it from people involved in the sport in North America as well as in Europe, is this idea. And, and it was typically, you know, not only just from old timers our age, but but even even people who are kind of uh, older millennials, they had the sense that players today, there's too much emphasis on skills. And and the word that was always used was that players today are robotic. Uh, yeah. that that there's so much emphasis on mastering skills, mastering skills, that uh, the kind of the creativity of the game has been lost. Um, and, uh, and in interviews, people like Gretzky and Bobby Orr have said the same thing. Gretzky and Bobby Orr have both said, I, I don't think there'd be a place in the game today for players of our uh originality and creativity you know the way that we played the game that would that would have been coached out of us by the time we got to got to the top levels so this is a pretty common complaint in hockey circles today i will say that there are you know there are people who say you know you got to admit that players today they're they're faster they're stronger they're better athletes than players of uh, players of the past. You know, I, I did an interview with uh, Ken Dryden's brother, Dave Dryden, who was a goalie in the NHL, and he also played in the WHA. He was a, he was a teammate of Gretzky for the Oilers in the WHA. And he said, you know, players today are phenomenal. You, you just watch them. The skills are amazing. I remember the one thing he said, he said, pretty soon, the puck isn't even going to touch the ice. You know, they're so good at working the puck around the rink. You know, it's, it's, and so he was one of these people who said, no, it's, you know, they're not turning into robots. You still see the creativity and now it's matched with, you know, with just amazing skill. Right. My thing is always like when they, when you see it in every sport, when they basically, they have to judge these people on what they can measure. Yep. Yep. And they don't, there's a lot of things that can't, they just don't know how to measure. Maybe they'll figure out how to measure them, you know, at some point. Like I always say, like, well, they should measure for kids. Like when a kid's on the ice, not the plus minus, but the, how much time is the puck in the offensive zone when a certain yep. kid's on the ice? Some kids just have a knack. You can't, like, they, you put them on the ice and suddenly the team's in the offensive zone and you don't know what they did because maybe they didn't even seem to do anything. But when that kid's yep. on the ice, they need to be on the offense and they take them off there on the defense. And I don't even understand how it happens, but it's real intangible. Yep. Yep. You know, yep. so it's it's interesting. I mean, if you took a team like, you know, the greatest team in NHL history, they say, like the 1977 Montreal Canadiens, mm -hmm. put them out on the ice right now. How would they how would they do? 
Yeah, that's a great question, right? So in terms of, remember I did an, uh, an interview with John Harrington who played for the 1980 Olympic team. And, and he said, and I, I was interviewing him in a restaurant. He kind of, you know, I asked him about players today as opposed to players of that era of the seventies. Right. And, and he looked around the restaurant. It was like, he didn't want anybody to overhear him. And he said, you know, when I watch films of Lafleur, you know, Guy Lafleur back with the Canadians in the seventies and you see him, you see him skating down with his hair flying and he takes a shot from the top of the, the face off circle and he beats the goalie on the far side. He said, you know, goal, goalies now are all six, five. They're the best athletes on teams. He, he's not making that shot anymore. You know, right. everybody, everybody is such a strong athlete that he said, you know, yeah, Lafleur is going to be great, but he wouldn't be as dominant as he was back well, in the, how back in the Dryden, 1970s. Dryden was like pretty big. Dryden yeah. Dry, yeah. Think of Dryden. And the reason why he was dominant, right, is he was just so big. And, but he was the size then of what pretty much all goalies are now. Um, you wouldn't have, this is something I heard from a few scouts and a few players, is that now because of the changes in training, uh, because hockey players are just so, you know, much in much better condition as athletes, you know, you still have the greats like, like Connor McDavid, uh, but the middle class of, of NHL players is much stronger in terms of of their overall abilities than was the case back in the 70s or 80s so so a player like lafleur back in the hmm. 70s wouldn't dominate in the same way because the people who are a step below him are are much better right than than that That's middle really, class was back in the 70s I, now that you say that i feel like i see that even with youth hockey like yes when, yeah, when I used to play when I was a kid, there would be a kid on every team that would skate through everybody and score, like, yep. you know, yep. four or five goals a game. Those kids don't exist anymore. Yeah, you're I mean, right. Other kids just stay with them. You almost hardly ever see hat tricks even, you know? Yeah, 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 you're right. And you think of that across youth sports, right? You think yeah. of that in soccer. You think of it in baseball. You think of it in hockey. Um you don't see that that dominant kid who's just you know head and shoulders above everybody else. You know you see a pretty even level of ability, uh, and certainly you'll see one kid who stands out. You know, or a couple kids who stand out, but they don't stand out in that same. You right. don't have people like Gretzky scoring. What did he get? You know, three hundred ninety nine goals in a year when he was a pee wee, yeah. right? Yeah, you you don't have that anymore. The only kid I saw stand out this year was a kid that was just pummeling everybody because he was just physically so large. You know. <laughs> That, would, that was me back in the time. <laughs> and it is true when you watch the old clips of those teams, there's goals you just don't under, it just wouldn't look like a goal. You know, it's like, uh, yeah, it just doesn't look like the goalie would have made, would have been an easy play for the goalie. It's so yeah. hard to score. Yeah. Goal, you know, goalie, goalie play is so much better now than it was, you know, 40 years ago. You know, uh, uh, goalies of our generation didn't get any coaching really. And also, uh, the goalies it, were sometimes, if you go back, like the kid who couldn't skate, they put him. Yes, in the exactly. Pack. You're right. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they they weren't, you know. But it's interesting for me. Like a big moment was when the uh, Flyers with Eric Lindros and John mm -hmm. LeClaire and that physically huge team yep. that beat, manhandled Mark Messier and the Rangers played Detroit with that Russian line, and they just the Russians just killed them. Yeah, you just yeah. skated right around them. You know, you couldn't put a team together based on size anymore because great skaters would just go right by them. Yeah, yeah. But, the, you know, and the thing with the Russians uh, and the thing with all European players who've been successful in the NHL is that they've not only been, they've not only been fast, but they're strong. Uh, you know, so the best, I, I asked a number of scouts when I was doing research for my, uh, for my book, uh, you know, who, who's got the best training now? Who's got the best player development? And they said the Finns and the Swedes. The Finns and the Swedes produce players who are just so fast. They're yeah. so skilled with the puck, but they are also just strong. So they can they can play the NHL game. They, uh, the Finns and the Swedes, have mastered what what is called this hybrid form of the game that you see in the NHL today, which blends European style movement and possession and passing and speed with the traditional toughness of the North American game of the NHL, and and the Swedes and the Finns uh, are really best trained for that. Uh, and so you'll see, um, 
you know, you'll see players uh, being sent from, say, the Czech Republic or Germany up to uh, up to Sweden and Finland to train, you yeah. know, to learn no, to true. learn this style of the of game. But here's the thing that always, and it's for all sports, which I look at it, and I go, okay, the players are so much better today, blah blah. But you go, okay, so Wayne Gretzky actually played with Gordy Howe. Yeah, and Gordy Howe is not. I mean, he then he got old, but he was still a, kind of effective for what he was. Yeah, but yes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and Gordy Howe played with Rocket Richard. Yeah, yeah. And it, and it wasn't like, you know, Gordy Howe is better than Rocket Richard. They're pretty much even, I think. So then you go all the way back. You know, you can link player to player to player. Yeah. Back to the 20s, back to the 30s. And it's hard to say, well, this guy can play with this guy and this guy can play with this yeah. guy. So. If you put Gordy, if you put a thirty-year-old Gordy Howe in the NHL right now, he'd have to be one of the best players in the league, you would think. Yeah. So that you know, <laughs> there there was a guy in Canada in Toronto. He was one of the first real experts in sports science. His name was Lloyd Percival, and and he ran kind of a gym and training center for athletes. And he did a series of uh, tests on Gordie Howe. And this was back in the late forties, you know, so when Gordie Howe was first starting out and he said, this guy is by far the best natural athlete I've ever encountered. And, uh, you know, and the stories about just how strong and fast and durable Gordie Howe was, you always have players like, and Mark Messier was another one. Yeah. Uh, when, when the Oilers would do, so the Oilers of the 1980s were one of the first teams to really incorporate exercise science into their training. Uh, they worked with researchers at the university of Alberta, uh, you know, for their training program for nutrition. And they had the players go through different tests and, and Mark Messier basically broke the testing equipment. He was so strong. So you always have athletes like that, not just in hockey, but in other sports who are just, you know, basically natural phenoms, right? They're just remarkable. And so if somebody like Gordy Howe or Mark Messier, certainly they could play, they could play in any generation. No, I saw there was a documentary about the fastball and major league baseball. And they figured out the the person throwing the fastest in history was probably Bob Feller. Yeah. You know, like in, was, they think it was running like 110 miles. An yeah, hour exactly. Or you know? Yeah. Or, yeah. You know, or bring, bring somebody like Walter Johnson who could, you know, certainly play today. Who is just, you know, a phenomenal, phenomenal athlete. So, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I guess we don't have that much more time. So I want to ask yeah. you what, what you wanted to accomplish with this book. What was your idea? What were you after? Oh, that's a great question. Yeah. Uh, one is just to have fun. You know, when I do book projects, I want something that is, is really going to engage me and, and it sounds wacky to people when I was doing research and I would tell, you know, friends would ask, what do you do? I sit in an archive for eight hours a day and it's, and it's just so much fun. So this was really a fascinating, engaging project from that. But, you know, the big question I was after and it, and it connects with, with your book, right? You know, your, your book, you're looking today at, at what you're dealing with as, as a hockey parent, right? And these questions of why, why is it so crazy? Why is it so demanding? Uh, what's going on here and how did this happen? My concern as a historian was how did we get to this, to this situation? That hockey is so expensive, so demanding in terms of time, uh, so crazy in terms of competition. What were the factors, the historical factors that brought us to this point? And I could see the strands of this going back decades, and they come from many different, you know, many different sources. And uh, so that was what was was fascinating. And I finished the book up with, you know, there are two main things I finished the book with. One is the question of climate. You know, what's going to yeah. happen to hockey in the future when when winter's gone, right? Uh, and the other question is, how did the game become so expensive and so demanding so that somebody like Gordy Howe, you know, Gordy Howe was from, you know, this impoverished family living on the prairies, living in a small prairie community during the Depression. You know, would somebody like Gordy Howe, he could certainly play, he's a phenomenal athlete, but would he get noticed, yeah. right? Would somebody of his background, would he be able to go to the showcases? Without a fam, you know, coming from a family without means. Dude, I so those are the two main questions. I was. The guy asked at. me how much hockey costs. Travel hockey when I was a kid. I was like, I don't know, because my parents didn't tell me. But yep, 
I do know that they sent me to summer camp and that cost $1,200 and they complained about it almost every day of the year. You know, <laughs> you better have had fun at that camp. It cost $1,200. Yeah. So yeah. It yeah, yeah. Less than that. You know, we had these very healthy house leagues because you couldn't convince parents then that, yep. why should I drive two hours so you can play hockey? When we have a rink right here in town. It didn't make exactly. any sense to them, you know? Yeah. And that, well, now we laugh at them to kind of, they were right in a way. It's yeah. like the amount of time you spend in the car just driving yep yeah when you could be actually playing the game yep always seemed you know crazy to me and it's almost like a arms race like everybody's got to do what everybody else is doing and it gets yep more and more tense and it costs more and more money and it's like a poker game where it's like you just keep anding it up anding it up and yep. and the truth is we're talking about the 0.1 percent of the people that are going to play college hockey Almost yep. all the kids my son plays that they're not even going to play college hockey. They might play high school hockey. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. And so yeah. this is it. I mean, you know. Yeah, I want to pick up on one thing. I know you said in your the interview you did uh, a couple weeks ago, where you said that the problems we see in youth hockey today are are reflective of larger, you know, what we see throughout American society, and that's spot on. Uh, the one thing I was struck by in the course of doing my research is that this isn't just and and. It's not just hockey, right? It's all sports, uh, all youth sports. It's not just an American problem. You see it around the world. You know, I encountered these same complaints talking with uh, talking with people in Europe and Czech Republic, uh, talking with people in Finland. Uh, I went to Korea where you just have this developing hockey program. There were the same complaints in, in that was, Korea. That's so fascinating. Cool yeah. stuff. Yeah. I mean, I think that, and by the way, it's just sports because I have a son who's a senior in high school going to college and it's the same for that. You yeah. know, it's like, yep. because in America, it seems so much like there's such fear of being left behind and yes. being cut Yep. and you're not on the right side of the cut. Your kid's not on the right side of the cut and that's going to be devastating. Yeah. It probably no. won't be devastating, yep. but you so badly don't want your kid to be hurt by not making it. Yep. And yeah. It, and, and I do think there's an economic thing, which is like, you know, there's a lot of money in it. So, the way you make money is you create stress intentionally or unintentionally, and then you sell the thing to alleviate the stress. Yeah. Thing to yeah. alleviate the stress, private lessons, clinic, summer camp, yep. you know? Yep. Yep. Yeah. No, that's, that's what I worked on in the book and looking back, you know, we can see the beginnings of it with the baby boomers, with our generation, generation X and our parents is when this really takes off. Uh, I look at the economic background to all of this, the cultural background. It's really a fascinating, you know, and, uh, and, and, and then you add in girls hockey and women's hockey and it adds a complete other dimension. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's really a fascinating, fascinating question as why, as to why we as parents are so consumed with our kids success in, in hockey or any sport or in theater or, or in school in general. No, yeah. the, the worst part is this, for me is like, it's not just being overly consumed, but knowing it's a, as stupid as I'm yes. doing it, but can't help. Yes. Yes, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Self awareness of what am I doing, but I got to do yep. it. You know? Yeah. Yeah. It's it's hard. To, it's hard to check yourself out of that. You know, it's it's really hard. Yeah. yeah. But you're right. So, do we have questions? I thought I saw one. Yeah. Hi. Hi. Um, a, I don't think we have a specific question yet. We just have a hello. Um, but I uh, have a question, or just could you talk a little bit more about the environmental? Yeah. Uh, side of of what's going on in your book bruce you we touched on it actually like a little bit before we even started recording um and you just mentioned it briefly and what you were trying to accomplish so i would love to hear a little more about about what you found um about where hockey's headed environmentally yeah so one of the things i talk about is that hockey emerges like other winter sports out of this this little ice age when the northern hemisphere is cooler and and the little ice age really ends or it's coming to an end in the in the mid 1800s so by the turn of the century into the early 20th century you already have warming winters especially uh especially in europe and so from the very beginnings of hockey um people are kind of lamenting that winters aren't as cold as they used to be uh, and so it's early in the 20th century, and this is particularly the case in Europe, where um, the, the availability of ice, of reliable ice, is, um, 
there's well there's not as much ice right so you have in in for instance in france in germany uh in england where you had had outdoor hockey in the late 1800s by the 19 teens and the 1920s you can't have that anymore so this is really a theme that runs throughout the history of the sport yeah. is this lament about is about the disappearing ice and uh i looked at it now and so of course we know that that global warming is global warming is accelerating and so rich you know during your and in, in my generation you know i played outdoor hockey all the time and and of course we know the story of uh of gretzky playing on his on his backyard rink and even in gretzky's hometown in brantford ontario uh the the temperature has warmed the average temperature in january i'm trying to remember the number uh something like six degrees uh during the month of january so uh so the ability to have an outdoor rink even in Canada is limited. Yeah. And so something I talk about in the book, and I and I borrow this from Adam Gopnik's book about winter, his cultural history of winter, is, is what's gonna happen to hockey when when winter's basically gone or when you have just a little sliver of outdoor uh, of outdoor skating that we still have, especially in North America, you know, we have such strong connection to this idea of hockey as a game played out in the elements, which is why pond hockey is so popular, which is why right. the outdoor NHL games are so popular. Uh, and what's going to happen when, you know, the only outdoor ice is, is artificial ice. And also, by the way, that goes back into your other thing about the economic thing, because the reason why a lot of the people that, you know, didn't have the money or whatever could play is because they just go play outside. It's free. Yep. 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 And indoor ice is expensive and you got to yes. pay a lot of money for it. That's the expense. Yes. Even yep. here and we're in Connecticut, so many families I know, I've been in this town for about 12 years. They all have these little outdoor rinks and I'm like, you're crazy because they melt five or six times a year and then they got to get a, it's a lot of work, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Like, like the water runs out and everything. And, and, you know, when I was growing up, they would freeze our, the big park in our town, they would just be frozen for four months and yeah. play all these games. So I do think that, that, that it is, and you know, it is, and our local rink was an indoor rink, I yeah. mean, an outdoor rink. Yeah. So that was always a huge part of it. And that is like uh, something where if you have, or if you're a hockey parent or a hockey kid, you know, that not only is, you know, climate change real, but it's happening very, yes. very quickly. You can watch it from winter to winter. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we have a question here, or well, we have a comment here from Judy. Um, the outdoor game in Tahoe just two weeks ago that had to be delayed because it was too warm. And uh, where I live, no community outdoor rink was built this year. So yeah, yeah all this is happening all over. Yeah. Uh, and here we have a question from Jody. I would like to hear a little more about the hockey development in Asia. Can you talk yes. About that? Oh, thank you. That's that's a favorite talk of mine. So part of my research, I went to uh, Korea for the 2018 Winter Olympics, and uh, and the main thing I was researching in Korea, uh, and so this was this was the first time this had ever happened that the the International Olympic Committee and the International Ice Hockey Federation allowed the host country South Korea to have its men's and women's hockey teams in the Olympic tournament. So typically the, the hockey teams have to go through a qualification process to get into the tournament. So, so the Korean men's and women's teams got in, even though they were not at the level of the Russians and Canadians and Americans and so forth. So on both the men's and women's side, they put in a lot of work to try to develop a team develop teams that would, you know, at least not embarrass themselves. And something I talk about in the beginning of the book is how both on the men's side and the women's side, they imported players from North America. On the women's case, it was women who had Korean heritage. On the men's side, it was just white Canadian guys and American guys who were naturalized as Korean citizens. And so I look at that and I look at the development, the attempts to develop a hockey culture in Korea. Hockey actually goes back to the 1920s in South Korea, uh, but it's still a, a small hockey culture and it connects a lot with some of the issues I talked about or we, Rich and I were talking about with just the expense. Um, with the demands on time, uh, you only have a few thousand registered players in Korea. The bigger issue in, in the development of East Asian hockey is what's going to happen in China, right? So China is hosting the next Winter Olympics and the Chinese government is really pushing to develop winter sports, <laughs> popular participation in winter sports, including in hockey. So there are two professional women's teams playing in China. 
uh, right now. And there's a, there's a professional men's team also that plays in the, uh, in the Russian league. And, uh, so they're really trying to develop fan interest and also, uh, participation among Chinese athletes. Cause apparently the, the Chinese are going to be able to do the same thing as, as was the case with the Koreans in the last winter Olympics and field teams in, in the tournament. So they're working to, they're working to be competitive, uh, in advance. But, you know, as in all things, you know, the hope is to tap into the Chinese market. The NHL certainly wants to do that. They've played exhibition games uh, in China. And, uh, you know, yeah, we can see, you know, will the future of hockey be uh, be in China or be in East Asia? It's interesting. I have one more question if there's time. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> weird, but so you write about it at the beginning of the book, and I'm with you, like when the U.S. Olympic team beat the Russians, 1980, Mm -hmm. And uh, you said that you actually got to listen to it live. Yeah. I was at school, I believe. And I remember I came home and the broadcaster was so excited. He said, I can't tell you what happened. It's on a tape delay, but just watch. Oh, the hell with it. We won. We won. So it kind of ruined it. But um, uh, but it was such a big deal. And we, But the American team won the gold like in Squaw Valley, didn't they? Yes, in 1960. Yeah, and that yeah. seemed to have no impact. Like there was no big thing with that. And why wasn't that a bigger deal? Well, you and I don't remember it, right? You know, yeah. so so you and I don't remember it in the 80s. Uh, but this is something I talk about in the book: is that when the Americans win in 1960, it does have a big effect in terms of American participation in hockey. Yeah. This is when youth hockey is just taking off in the 1950s and early 1960s in the United States, and the U.S. win in the 1960 Winter Olympics really does have a catalyzing effect. Oh, and so, yeah. so the hero of that team was the goalie Jack McCartan. And, and I actually interviewed him. It was a great, great interview. And he talked about, you know, he was signed right away with the Rangers. You know, very few Americans played in the NHL back then. He signed right away with the Rangers. He was on the Today Show. He was on the, he was in Time Magazine and Newsweek. You know, he got a ton of press coverage and American hockey got a ton of press coverage. And so this really did spur the early development of youth hockey and the development of programs, you yep. know, mainly up, mainly up in the Northeast and in the Midwest. That's probably why I played hockey when I was a kid. Exactly. You're, you're, you're likely right. Yeah. That was the initial spur. Yeah. yeah I started playing like in 1971, 72. So. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, I feel like I could talk to you all night. About <laughs> yeah. This is fun. This is, yeah, that went fast. Holy cow. Yeah. Well, as you can tell, uh, there's a lot of stuff going on in Bruce's book. Uh, it is truly a, a history, a global history of ice hockey. So um, I will say this: like, there's not there's not enough really good hockey books. And Bruce has written one. I mean, thank you, thank you, Rich. Many yeah. many great baseball books, basketball books. Hockey is not well served. It has its great books, but there's just not enough of them. And now yeah. there's another one. So thank you. And I'll return the compliment. Say the, the, the book you wrote, you wrote is a book that needed to be written, you know, about, about just the craziness of youth hockey today. So, so I salute you for coming up with a, with I a great it topic. Overtook, it overtook my life. I had to write it. I had to write about <laughs> it just to get free. <laughs> uh, well uh as i said at the beginning of the hour uh the links directly to both of those books are in the comments under this video so both of those links will take you to majorsandquinn.com and you can check out fastest game in the world and peewees and i hope that um you join us at another virtual event sometime thank you for watching thank you both for being here um thanks rich for coming back and being our interviewer this time around um it's always nice to keep that going and have people back that we've done events with before so i hope you have a wonderful rest of your evening everybody thanks thanks and, bruce yeah thanks rich i appreciate it thanks annie and thanks everybody bye see you this summer annie yeah. <laughs>